example, misophonia literally translates to hatred of sound. I can see sadness caressing their faces daily as it envelops them into a bone crushing hug. Your scars are your medal, wear them with pride. I don't know, love is light. The Prophet, peace be upon him, said, Each so home, for there is a blessing. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. We are all welcome back to Black Rose TV AG and if you are a returning subscriber, thank you so much for being here. And if this is your first time on this channel, you are in the right place. Okay, just do me a favor by subscribing and then click on that notification bell beside it so that you get notified when a new video is being uploaded. I am Rebecca Muhammad Salis and today we are going to be talking about the status of women in Islam. The status of women. Women have been the subject of discussion since from the beginning of history. Uh, before Islam, I'm going, to I'm going to take this into the three parts. The status of women before Islam, the status of women after Islam, and the rights of women in Islam. There are a lot of controversies going on in the world about women being oppressed by Islam. Well, I'm here to talk about those right here on this video. So do stick to the end so that you get to know what the status of women are in Islam and the rights of women in Islam. Women before Islam have been objectified since the beginning of history. They are known to be, they are known to not be considered in, in the society. Some, especially for example in the Arab, uh, in the Arab community before Islam, that is known as the Jahiliya period. The Jahiliya period is the period before the coming of Islam in the Arab community. Women have been tortured, has, have been objectified, their rights have been taken away from them. So, during that period, women are not known to be important people in the society. When a man hears a news of a girl being born into his family, he weeps out of sorrow because the woman, the girl child in that period, the Jahiliya period, was not, was not, does not have any significance in the society. She's only known to be in the house without any say. She's silent without, like her rights are being taken away from her. So in that period, women were objectified. Women suffered a lot because a man can die and then his son will inherit all his mother's, all the man's wife, that is his father's wife, wives. He will inherit them as part of what he inherited from his father and also conduct his daily duties as a husband to them. SubhanAllah, when you look at this, it's a very dark period for women because when women are on their main monthly cycle in those times, they are taken to the outskirts of the town. They're not, some families do not allow their women to have their monthly cycle in the household. They take them outside the city. When they are done, they bring, them, they bring them back. Because what they believe in that period is they're not worthy to be in that house. Like It's like they're a dirt that they need to remove in that household for a certain period of time. So subhanAllah, when we look at things like that, like it brings, it's a very dark period for women in that, in that era before Islam. And also, when a girl is being, like it's a normal thing for a girl to be born into a family, and then the father will bury her, like beneath earth, as if she's dead. She's alive, but they will bury her in that period. And the mothers have no say over that. They feel even ashamed to say that they have given birth to a, to a baby girl. They've given birth to a daughter into the family. Like it's like a taboo for them to have. And when a woman fails to give birth to a son, then that because that becomes a really big problem for her. She can, like women have been banished from their homes during that time. Women have been maltreated in that period of time. And to be honest, if there's any form of oppression that has been going on in the world, I believe that is the period that women were oppressed. Okay, we're moving on to our next stage, which is the status of women during Islam or after Islam. When Islam came, women were being, women gained their freedom because women were treated with so much respect and honor in the society. After Islam, the Jahiliya period was done. Then when Islam came, the Prophet them gave women so much respect and dignity and honor in the society to a point that when 
after Allah and Rasulullah, the next person that should have a huge influence, the next person that you should be on your love, your care and respect in the society is your mother. The Prophet is the upon him repeated this in hadith three times. He mentioned that a person should love, should love, cherish and respect his mother after Allah and Rasulullah. The next person is the mother three times before he mentioned the father. Your mother, your mother, your mother and then qala thumma abuka. Subhanallah. If this is not liberation, then I don't know what this is. Like the person who has the highest status in your life, apart from Allah and Rasulullah subhanahu wa sallam, is your mother. Like a woman has that big position in your life that you should give all, all you have, all you, you should dedicate your life to respecting and honoring them, apart from Allah and Rasulullah. The next person, immediately after them, is your mother. Then I don't know what kind of liberation and honor is this. There was also a scenario that happened in the midst, in the presence of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. A man was crying profusely in, in the presence of Rasulullah. A sahab was crying profusely in the presence of Rasulullah. He was he was asked what happened. Then he said he remembered something that he did in the Jahiliya period. Then he told Rasulullah a story that he travelled. He left his wife pregnant, and then when he came back, she gave birth to a child, and this child happens to be a daughter. Happens to be a girl. The girl is not just a baby, she has become somehow a toddler. Then he asks the mother to, to get the girl like ready that is taking her somewhere. He took the girl, the mother bathed the child, the daughter. She put on very nice clothes on that girl. And then he took her and she never saw her daughter again. When he took her, he took her to the farthest, oldest well that has no water in the city, in the outskirts of the city. The woman, when he was taking the daughter away because she knew what he was about to do, she told him, do not do something that you will regret of. Do not do something that you will be a betrayer. Do not betray this girl. He took her to the outskirts of the city. He searched for um, the oldest well that has no water full of stones in it. Then he just took this daughter and just threw her into that well. Before that, when he was trying to dig a hole close to the well, there was sand on his bed. The girl was trying to clean his bed for him, but still he didn't see that. He took that girl and threw her into that well. When he did that, he, he heard her cry when she fell into the well. SubhanAllah, can we? Like, this is a level, a level of cruelty that has been happening to women in that period. When she fell into the well, he waited for some minutes to see if she's still alive. Then he took a very big stone and threw it into the well to be sure that the girl is not alive, like to be sure that the girl is dead. When I came across this story, I was like, SubhanAllah, if the world sees women now as oppressed, then I don't know what, this, what oppression is. Because this is a total level of injustice because in that period, it was a very dark time for women in that period. So when he was saying this, like all, everybody was crying, because it's in the, pres in the presence of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the Prophet said, if there's anything that you have done in the Jahiliya period, and Allah will do his sab for you, based on that, it will be this. Islam is a religion that liberates women since the beginning of history. Like a woman has a very high standard. And then there's another habit of the Prophet that can be. The best of you is that who is kind, who is fervent, who is merciful to his, to his family. Like the Prophet honors women and respects them, and not just respects them, but has sympathy and empathy for them. But if the best of people is that who is the merciful, who is merciful to his family, to his wives, to his, to his daughters, to his children, who is kind to his wives, to his daughters, to his children in all these aspects. Like, you are the best of people in the society if you are kind to your family, if you are nice to your wives, if you are, if you favor, if you are sympathetic, or if you have empathy for your wives and your daughters, then I don't know. Then nobody has the right to call women oppressed in Islam. And, it's, and Islam, Islam gave us our right to do a lot of things. During the time of the Prophet Sallallahu his wife Khadija was a businesswoman. And when he married her, she was still a businesswoman. But 
what happened was he didn't ask her to stop her business. He did not ask her to stop doing what she was doing because now she's married to him. He helped her instead. He helped her in booming that business. He helped her in progressing and improving the business. So I do not think that women are being oppressed in Islam as the society or the media depicts now. When you look into the media, all we can see is Islam has oppressed women, especially if you wear the hijab or if you wear the niqab in Islam, you are oppressed. A lot of questions have been passed on to me and other niqabs and other hijabs as well. Like, does your father make you to wear this? Are you forced to wear this? I do not see anything that is forced in Islam. Then we are going to move to the rights of women in Islam. SubhanAllah. I can't begin to imagine like any religion that would consider almost everything related to a woman like Islam. The rights of women in Islam, a right to independent ownership. When a woman owns assets, those assets are her own. They're not her father's, they're not her mother's, they're not her husband's. They belong to her and she has the right to own them and she has the right to do whatever she wants with those assets that she has. So, so in Islam, even when she's married, her assets remain her own. They're not her husband's properties. They are her own property. Islam has given women this right. And then secondly, the right to marry by choice. Islam has given women the right to marry by choice. There was uh, something that happened also during the time of the Prophet Sallallahu a girl was forcefully have a girl was forcefully married to a man during the time of the Prophet. And then she went and asked the Prophet that does her father have the full control? Like does her father have that control to forcefully marry her off to somebody that she does not wish to marry? The Prophet said if she wishes that the marriage can be notified right away without even consulting her father. So he said, You have two options, either to stay in the marriage or to nullify the marriage. She said, I just want the world to know that parents are not in full control. Like parents cannot forcefully marry their children without their consent. Yeah Allah, when we look at this like the Rasulullah wasallam to nullify a marriage because the girl does not wish to marry that person or does not wish to be with that man in that period. Like it's something very big. So Islam has parents are advised they can advise a girl, especially if she has not married. If she has not married, they can advise her to look into this person. Like, okay, we have found somebody for you. We would appreciate it if you can look into him. But we are not forcing you on this person. We are not going to force you to marry that person. You can force a horse to the river, but you cannot force him to drink. I think it's similar to this expression is similar to this kind of scenario. Like you can only point her to a direction, okay, this is what we want, like this is what we are reaching for, but if we have another option, it is fine with us, we respect your only option. So Islam never forces, you know, Islam is never in support, in support of forced marriage. Islam is never in support, in support of forced marriages. Another one, another right is the right to divorce. If a woman feels that she cannot stay in the marriage, maybe because of her own personal reasons, if her reasons are valid enough to show that she cannot be in that marriage, she has the right to seek for divorce in that marriage, but she will have to return his uh, mahab to him. His mahab, mahab is the bride price, the dowry. She has the, but she has to return his mahab to him because I'm no longer interested in this contract then, okay. This is your contract, please can you leave? Can you allow me to leave? She has the right to seek for divorce when she feels that she doesn't know not she does not she no longer wants to be in the marriage because of but her reasons have to be valid. That is just it. And then another right is the right to education. The right to education. I so much love this right because Islam since the beginning of history has been like in support of girls seeking for education, succeeding in any aspect of life. If we look at the house of the household of the Prophet Wasallam, not just the household of the Prophet Wasallam, but the history of Islam, like one of the people that have contributed immensely to Islam is the wife of the Prophet Aisha bint Abbaqa radiallahu anha. Like she has contributed to Islam in the path of hadith, in a lot in the in the Sunnah of the Prophet, peace be upon him, because she has memorized a lot of her, thousands of hadiths. She is amongst the people that have contributed in the part of hadith and Sunnah 
in Islam. The sky is just has certain limits when it comes to seeking education. Like it's it is the right of a woman that she should be educated in Islam. This is a right, and this is not just a right, but I think it's an obligation for a father to educate his daughter. If he cannot, if she's married, her husband should educate her. If he cannot educate her, he should give her the chance to go and seek for it. It's not just any education. Okay, don't come at me for saying this. It's not just any education. It is the education that is going to help her, especially Islamic education. Moving to the next one is the right to keep identity. When a woman is married, in Islam, it is haram for a woman to take her husband's name. It is her right to keep identity. It's not just the woman, but also I think everybody in Islam, even men. There was a companion of the Prophet وسلم, who has been acquainted, like he was so much acquainted with the Prophet وسلم, he's always there, he, like he has no boundaries in the households of the Prophet وسلم, he is always with the Prophet. So people started calling him Zaynab Muhammad. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent an ayah, like a, an ayah was revealed to the Prophet that every person should keep the identity of their fathers. Like you have that right, it is a, an obligation onto you to keep your own father's identity. But in these days, like what we see is the moment a woman you borrow from the Western world, that the moment a woman is married, she has to take up the identity of her husband. She has to be called with her husband's name. And this is not condoned in Islam. You have to keep your identity. It's not just for the woman. It is more encouraged in women to keep their own identities even after marriage. They should, everybody should keep his own identity, but it is more encouraged for women to keep their own identity even after marriage. Then, right to inheritance. In Islam, when of, before the coming of Islam, during the Jahiliya period, as I've stated earlier, when a man dies, the women are also part of what people, are, are also part of what his sons inherit from his love. They are being objectified at that during that period. But, but when Islam came, he gave us the right to also be inherit to also inherit something from our fathers, from our brothers, from everywhere. There is even a point to a point that you will find a woman's inheritance, like what a woman, the percentage of what a woman inherits is far greater than that of a son that he, he inherits. And inherit and how inheritance works in Islam is for every man, like for two women, they have a share of a man. Every two women have a share of a man. So women, they inherit half what the man inherits. Yes, some people come at this ayah because I'm not a sheikha. Let me just put that out there. But from my own little knowledge, from, from the little I know is a man takes up the responsibility of a house. A man takes up the responsibility of the house. So when he dies, the responsibility indirectly or automatically comes down to the to the to the son in the family. Like the son becomes the father figure in the family, and mostly families they always have the boys, they are the older children in that family. Even if they are not like you will see in a family, especially in an Islamic household, the family, the boys are always the father figures in that family. So when, who is a father figure? What makes them a father figure? What makes them a father figure in that family is because they take up the responsibilities of the father. Now they are the fathers in charge. They are the ones in charge of those women. When she is sick, he has to take her to the hospital. When she needs education, he has to he has to pay for her education. He has to pay for her health. He has to pay for her feeding. He has to put a roof over her head. He has to clothe her. So he is using his own money to take care of that female. In this case, that is why he has to inherit as, as double the percentage she inherits in, a, in an inheritance. This is how it works. So all those responsibilities have been transferred onto him and he is using his own money to take care of him without asking for a dime in your own inheritance money. I believe this is fair enough for women because of course you are taking care of him. The least I can do is just respect you and then honor that. And I have been given my own, and my own stays my own. As I have stated, um, as I've said earlier, earlier, the right to independent ownership. It is my own possession now. You have no right to ask for a dime in my own possession. You have no right to take a dime out of my own possession.
So I do not believe, I believe this is fair enough. Let the academy of the Hakim Ruthain justifies everything. Islam justifies everything. Like every aspect of our life, of our lives, Islam has justified it. The right to go to the masjid. During the time of the Prophet, there's a hadith. I cannot quote, I quote it completely. But there's a hadith that said when they when your women ask you to go to the masjid, do not prohibit them from doing so. Allow them to go. It is a right for the woman to go to the masjid as long as you have the proper, you're going there with the proper etiquette. You have the right to go to the masjid. Yes, that is just, let me just put that out there. And the other one is the right to work opportunities. A woman has the right to work as long as it does not affect her own duties. She has the right to work. You can, yes, a woman has the right to be led to go to work. Just as the time of the Prophet, as I've cited earlier, the Prophet وسلم, and Khadija, when he married her, he did not ask her to stop her business. She was a businesswoman. He did not ask her, to, okay, now you're married, no more business. For instance, he helped her in building that business. He helped her in improving it. So the woman has the right to work in Islam, just as I cited earlier. And I'm, I'm citing examples back to the time of the Prophet because that is the time, the beginning era of Islam. Like that was a time where Islam has fought so many adversities. Islam has fought a lot of battles, not just the battles that we've known the Prophet has fought in the battlefield, but there are some intellectual bat battles that Islam has fought. And I believe no woman is oppressed in Islam. Islam has liberated us from a lot of social, from a lot of societal beliefs and all. So all I can say here is Islam is a religion that leaves no stone unturned. It leaves no stone unturned and it gives everybody their own their own rights. It's not just women, it's even the even the men have their own rights in Islam. But in this case, as the world now in the society that we live with what, with what the media has been portrayed, I believe and I feel the need to just come out and say this. You had me fight people saying, Okay, Islam has liberated me. I need to do this because I am a Muslim. What people think is that Islam is holding women back from achieving their dreams. We have a lot of women. Since from the beginning of history till that we have contributed to the society immensely in ways that we can't even imagine. They have contributed more than the rights. I'm not I'm not condemning anybody or anyone, but it's just it is what it is. That's just it. Islam has liberated us. Islam has given us our full rights, and this is just it. I think that's all about the, um, the rights of Islam, the rights of women in Islam, <laughs> the rights of women in, in Islam. If I have omitted anything, please just let me know. Let me know down in the comment section. And if you have any other thing, any questions you want to ask me, the comment section is always open for you guys. Do not forget to subscribe if you have not. Please, if you're in, if this is your first time on this channel, before you leave, just subscribe to the channel, like, subscribe, and share it out. Thank you so much. Meet you.